In his book, Maps of the Mind, Charles Hamden Turner makes a plea for, and I quote, the revision of social science, religion, and philosophy to stress connectedness, coherence, relationship, organicism, and wholeness as against the fragmenting, reductive, and compartmentalizing forces of the prevailing orthodoxies. My belief is that industrial cultures are dangerously over-differentiated and under-integrated. We compulsively exaggerate our differences while ignoring what we have in common. The maps here are deliberately selected and described with a view to their overall compatibility, complementarity and convergence. W.H. Auden wrote that we must love each other or die. Love is a trifle too ambitious, perhaps, but we can understand. As it happens, I agree with him, although I describe my approach as following three values, curiosity, love, and growth. Curiosity helps me ask questions to try and understand. What I mean by love is accepting those things we may be trying to repress in ourselves, but that trigger us when we see them in others. And growth happens when we integrate those pieces into our consciousness. Today's topic is not exactly about personality types, but following last week's video on the differences between type and trait approaches, I've chosen maps based on Freud, Jung, and Isenck to show different ways we can be curious about our minds. A little caveat before we start, the map is not the territory. Your perspective matters, and Hamden Turner illustrates this by using Viktor Frankl's shadow maps. As you can see, a cylinder, a cone, and a sphere all cast the same shadow until you switch the light source around. Linda Behrens actually uses this example in her work with types as well. If you imagine that each shadow represents a behavior of a person and the shapes are different types, when you walk into an office, you might see a certain behavior, but that doesn't mean that you can absolutely know which type makes this behavior because different shapes can make the same, shadow slash behavior, you know where I'm going with this. Okay, the book was published in 1981 and my copy is a bit battered, but hopefully the images will speak for themselves. Let's start with Sigmund. Freud's contribution to our understanding of the mind was that he showed us the effects of the unconscious on conscious processes. He proposed that the human personality has a structure of contrasting functions, namely the unconscious id, and the partly conscious ego. The id consists of instinctual energies and drives that are without rationale or inhibition, whereas the ego works to satisfy the id's demands while also being respectable and engaging with the environment. The dangers of being overwhelmed by these impulses from the id uh, they're kept in check by learning to postpone gratification and setting up emotional barriers, which Freud called ego defense mechanisms. These defense mechanisms, including repression, projection, displacement, and sublimation, are unconscious. And while they're necessary and helpful to a point, they also use up a lot of energy. So Freud believed that repression leads to neurotic symptoms, which tend to repeat themselves in vicious circles of frustration. And then you have dreams and waking fantasies as an important way in which we try to satisfy those repressed ideas and wishes and instincts because we can't live them out in polite society. Now, Carl Jung, was a contemporary of Freud's and actually quite famous for word association tests before the two even met. For a while, Jung was supposedly Freud's heir apparent, but Freud didn't like to be criticized, so they had a big falling out when Jung actually disagreed with Freud's views on psychosexual development, among other things. They both had similar ideas about the ego, conscious and unconscious mind, but Jung's concept of the unconscious was more elaborate than Freud's. Jung actually believed in the existence of a collective unconscious. He saw this as the inherited possibility of psychical functioning and as a shared human heritage. He used the term archetypes to describe how psychic processes transformed into images and posited that the archetypal structuring of the unconscious pulled experience and memories into polar forms along opposing axes. In other words, Jung's model put certain structures, functions, attitudes, and archetypes 
on opposing ends of a system. So you have consciousness and unconscious parts of the psyche. Uh, they were polarized between two attitudes of extroversion and introversion. And then the functions were polarized between, for example, thinking and feeling. And the archetypes are opposites, for example, virgin and mother. Jung also believed that Western culture was overly uh, dominant in the thinking function and needed to achieve insight, wholeness and spiritual depth. And I have another video about his model of the psyche here. Most behaviorists disapprove of maps, models and schemas. They prefer collecting evidence. However, Isenck is an exception as he focused on inherited physiological factors of mental functioning. In other words, the biological and the genetic basis for behavior. Unlike his colleagues Pavlov and Skinner, Isenck argued that the mind is not a black box, but it actually contains inherent predispositions to react in crucial ways. He borrowed the same four humors from the ancient Greek physician Galen that Kiersey also used as a basis for his four temperaments. Caleric being angry, phlegmatic, self-possessed, and sanguine, cheerful, and melancholic, sad. Isaac placed them between the two main axes that he saw as physiological dimensions for inherited mental dispositions. You have stability and instability and introversion, extroversion. He saw these as balancing the systems within the body's central nervous system, where the sympathetic part controls emergency reactions like fight or flight, and the parasympathetic part prepares the body for rest and recovery. He argued that people vary considerably on this dimension in terms of emotional reactivity, and he attributed introversion extroversion dimensions to the ascending reticular formation, which is a brain structure that regulates arousal and consciousness. So using this model, Eisen categorized a variety of individuals into groups. For example, male criminals tended to fall into the unstable extroverted quadrant, or neurotics would fall into the unstable introverted quadrant. Having said that, apparently Isaac's approach has been successful when used to treat unstable anxiety reactions. Behavioral therapists like Volpe actually have taught their anxious patients to use relaxation techniques and add a learned parasympathetic relaxation response in the face of triggers. You'll have noticed the different descriptions in the corners of the images. Level one maps describe the mind in terms of gods and machines. For example, the dualism of Descartes. Level two was the psychoanalytic level, level three is the physiological or biological level, and the book goes into more beautiful descriptions of level four, creative, level five, psychosocial, for example, Eric Erickson's model of ego development. Six was language, for example, here's one for Chomsky, Bandler and Grinder. Uh, level seven is psychobiology, level eight is paradigmatic, and level nine is the most inclusive level. It's a lovely book with lots of insight, into different ways people have tried to make sense of themselves and our minds and there are a total of 60 maps to explore. I'll put a link in the description if you'd like to check it out. And that's it from me for today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.